Hare Krishna to all of you. Welcome from Institute for Science and Spirituality. And uh, so uh, we shall wait for two, three more minutes so that uh, more number of uh, participants join, then we'll start. So uh, this uh, today's topic, basically it's a, it's a two session series. And uh, today is the first lecture in this series. And the next Sunday we'll have second one. So this uh, science and religion, conflict, cooperation and coexistence. So the name of the first session is the problem of scientific materialism. So we shall start uh, just after at 5.35 we'll start. Okay. So uh, Professor Gopal Gupta has also joined. So I'll uh, just go through uh, Professor Gupta's profile. Professor, okay. Okay, so I hope uh, I'm audible. So, Dr. Gopal K. Gupta is an associate professor at the University of Evansville, USA where he teaches courses that explore the world's living religions, Eastern religious philosophies, and intersection between science and religion. His book, Maya in the Bhagavad Purana, Human Suffering and Divine Play, is published by Oxford University Press. Dr. Gupta serves as an editor for the Journal of Hindu Christian Studies, JHCS. JHCS is a widely read peer reviewed journal in the field of comparative religion. He has authored various articles in academic books and journals and uh, presented at numerous conferences. Some of his works include Hindu Perspective on Artificial Life and the Self, Woman as Maya, Gendered Narrative in the Bhagavad Puran and may calamities befall us at every step. The Bhagavad's response to the problem of evil. Dr. Gupta completed his DPhil in religious studies and <coughs> MST in science and religion from the University of Oxford, UK. So we welcome uh, Dr. Gupta uh, for today's session. So, uh, Dr. Gupta, over to you. Hello, it's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, and uh, my understanding is that many of you here are deeply interested in the topic of science and spirituality and the relationship between science and spirituality. So uh, today I'm going to sort of carry that theme forward by looking at, um, looking at a very basic sort of fundamental topic uh, in this field, which is scientific materialism and reflecting upon what are some, uh, some problems, some challenges uh, in the viewpoint of scientific materialism? Um, what are the critiques of scientific materialism? The viewpoint that science and religion are in conflict. So here I've uh, shared my slides. So science and religion, conflict, coexistence, confirmation, or cooperation. Um, these are uh, four ways to relate science and religion. 
Um, one can see science and religion in conflict. One can see science and religion as independent of one another, uh, which is often called non-overlapping magisteria, meaning that science and religion are in two completely separate fields of study. They don't have anything to do with one another. Some people say that science answers the how questions, re religion answers the why questions. This viewpoint is not so much in vogue because they both do deal with the same questions and uh, questions about the beginning of life, um, you know, questions about the end of the universe. So, um, but anyway, there's a viewpoint of independence. A third uh, way to relate science and religion is as dialogue. So science and religion are in dialogue. They can help one another uh, in the progress of knowledge. So science and religion complement one another. And the fourth option is integration, that science and religion are uh, very closely related or integrated with one another. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to talk about the first thesis, which is the conflict thesis. Why? Because although science and religion have a lot to do with, uh, you know, can help one another, they have a lot to do with one another, the common perception, a very common perception, is that science and religion are in conflict. And this common perception is something that is propagated by a school of philosophy called scientific materialism. So I'll look back at, um, you know, I'll start with some contemporary, somewhat contemporary authors, and then also look back at some more historical discussions about the relationship between science and religion in terms of conflict. So in contemporary times, uh, there are various books that have uh, come up. And these books <clears throat> talk about atheism, books on atheism um, that are you know, very popular, popular texts, um, uh, widely read all over the world. And these books um, are books on atheism, books that talk about how the atheists are revolting, how the idea of God is a delusion, how God is not great. Um, Daniel Dennett has this book, Breaking the Spell, which argues that consciousness and the idea of God and the idea of a soul, a spiritual entity, it's all part of an illusion or a spell. And how um, it's his job and it's the job of the you know, thinkers of the world today to remove this spell and bring people to the light, which is uh, the realization that there is no God, there is no soul. Now, these are books on atheism, and atheism has existed as long as theism has existed. Atheism has always been there. Um, but what is unique about this form of atheism? Why is this form of atheism so popular today? Who can say on the call? Um, I think many of you are PhDs here and uh, have maybe read some of these books. What is unique about this form of atheism? Maybe uh, it is referring to that everything can be explained by experiment, by science. Aha, uh -huh. okay, very good. And that everything can be explained by science. And I see here in the chat, um, in the garb of science, okay, or militant atheism. Yes, uh, this is actually true that uh, some people have called it evangelical atheism. So it's a, almost a very religious form of atheism. Actually, it's hard for me to see the chat while I speak. So feel free to unmute and uh, speak out. Um, uh, what is unique about this form of atheism? I think uh, people can unmute themselves and speak. Uh, I couldn't follow that. Say that again. 
rather than sign ah okay i still couldn't hear but i think maybe you were saying that it uses science as the basis of its atheism so this is exactly what is unique about this form of atheism that uh that as many of you have pointed towards it is atheism it, it tends to argue make the same arguments that atheists have made since many many you know centuries but it uses science as the basis for atheism and it tends to um popularize a common misperception which is if you are a good scientist if you believe in science then you cannot believe in religion science is inherently in conflict with religion for example richard dawkins who's written this book the god delusion a very famous uh, author um he's the uh, oxford professor for the public understanding of science so he's a biologist uh at the same time he's a professor for the public understanding of science and his understanding of science is that it's inherently atheistic and this is what is communicated to the public so these are forms um of atheism that oftentimes rely on this sort of flawed conception that science is inherently atheistic uh but let's look at what their claims are and let's see uh whether or not uh we agree with them so scientific materialism has two claims the first one is an ontological claim an ontological claim is regarding what exists uh ontology is you know the study of what exists what is real so the first claim of scientific materialism that you will find very often um in these books whether explicitly or implicitly present uh is that reality consists only of things discoverable by science that if something is actually real if if something's actually um <clears throat> um you know not just a illusion or a or a phantom is agoria uh, it should be measurable and quantifiable it should be discoverable by science so only things that are discoverable by science are real things that are beyond the reach of science or outside of sci scientific uh, you know experimentation as one of you mentioned um those are not real that's just uh, in stories storytelling and the second is um an epistemological claim an epistemological claim is a claim about epistemology which means a claim regarding how do we know what we know so um an epistemological claim for example is the best way to um uh to uh to experience uh Uh, the quality of honey is to taste it so it's a claim regarding how do you get knowledge about a certain a certain thing that exists so the ontological claim would be that honey exists the honey is a real food and the epistemological claim is well the best way to experience what it is is by tasting it not by seeing it or not by hearing it or not by smelling it but the primary way to experience honey is by tasting it so that is an epistemological claim so their epistemological claim is that science is the only legitimate path to knowledge that if you want to know something if you truly want to understand something the only process of knowing it the only pathway to true knowledge knowledge that again is not simply uh you know uh storytelling or just you know fairy tales is if you want actual you know dependable knowledge then science is the only legitimate path to knowledge so these are the two claims of scientific materialism the ontological claim and the epistemological claim and um uh this this is also kind of the heart of the conflict thesis this is also why uh you know these philosophers think that science and religion are in conflict because science gives the true knowledge but religion does not uh, science leads you to reality science identifies what is real but religion does not 
So I'll read a few quotes from these books uh, by these different authors like Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, he says, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. No design, no purpose, no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. So this is from his book, The God Delusion. The universe that we observe has no design, no purpose, no good, no evil, just blind, pitiless indifference. Um, so there really is no God. There's no um, uh, you know, soul or purpose or meaning. Steven Weinberg, uh, if we use science as our guide, right? Steven Weinberg, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. And finally, Richard Lewitton, he says, the problems, the problem is to get the public, that is all of us, to reject irrational and supernatural explanations of the world, the demons that exist only in their imaginations, <clears throat> and to accept a social and intellectual apparatus, science as the only begetter of truth. So um, all of this, you know, religion and philosophy and uh, all of this, this is just irrational and supernatural. Um, science is the only begetter of truth, right? So this is the epistemological claim that science is the only pathway to knowledge. <clears throat> um, science is the only begetter of truth. So this is, um, uh, this is the, you could say, the, the heart of this, this debate. And now, um, as reasonable intellectual people, we'll try to see, is this claim um, reasonable? Are the claims of scientific materialism, do they make sense? So here are these two claims again. Uh, what do you think might be a problem or, uh, you know, what do you see as a problem or a challenge in these claims? Would anyone like to suggest? <clears throat> do you agree with these claims of scientific materialism or do you find them to be problematic? If so, why? Maybe in the first, the reality consists only of things discoverable, that is measurable and quantifiable. Maybe how do we know that reality should be measurable or quantifiable? Mm. Okay. So is that an assumption, right? That, uh, yeah, it reality... seems to be an assumption, basically. Okay, very nice. Very good, yes. Other suggestions? I was thinking that by this definition, again, the first point, the ontology, anything, uh, I think it's an extension of the what the previous person said. There cannot be anything exist which I cannot perceive. If I don't perceive, then it must not exist. That's what it seems to be saying. Uh -huh. And and that, and here I'm seeing seeing perceived by my five senses. Okay. Okay. But one could say, isn't all of knowledge, any knowledge uh, that we gain perceived through our five senses? So in support of scientific materialism, one could say, well, um, you know, even religious knowledge, even knowledge about God is understood through our senses. I mean, ultimately we have to read the scriptures and it's only through our senses that we can read the scriptures. Um, it's only through our senses that we can, you know, see um, images of God or, you know, um, it's through our senses that we can talk about God. Hello, sir. Yes, hello. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Ragnar Pandey from India, uh, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. Namaste. Uh, namaskar. Uh, that uh, what topic you have taken now, uh, that is uh, uh, our senses are very limited. And mm. uh, just from limited senses, uh, we can't perceive everything. Mm. Suppose uh, even you can't uh, perceive uh, microbes mm. without a microscope. Mm. So till microbes was not discovered, we are, have very limited knowledge about uh, viruses and all those things. Mm -hmm. So, yes. 
सो टू परसीव सुपर स्पिरिचुअल सुपर स्पिरिचुअल थिंग वी हैव टू सुपर स्पिरिचुअल नॉलेज दैट इज द वन पॉइंट एंड अदर पॉइंट इज इन योर डिस्कशन यू हैव नॉट टेकन एनी standard book established book neither you have taken the reference of gita neither you have taken the <coughs> reference of ramayana even mm. bible even quran mm. yes so yes you... so thank you okay. yes so all very good points that these uh, that the senses are very limited and therefore uh, the knowledge that we get through our senses may also be limited and in relation to this uh one of the factors is that scientific knowledge or scientific discoveries are continuously changing right so <clears throat> science is continuously changing and scientific discoveries change but re- reality does not change right so uh one of the problems with this claim is that if reality consists only of things discoverable by science then that means when science changes reality also changes which is something obviously that we would not agree with uh for example uh in classical newtonian physics newton uh he spoke of the world as a clock everything is very measurable um all you know all of space and time is absolute uh, space and time does not change and then when einstein came along he talked about the theory of relativity that how <clears throat> the the you know the aspects of this world a uh, space and time are relative based upon where the observer is present and therefore the experience of time here where you are sitting or the experience of time on top of a 100 story building is different and today in science they actually have uh, have verified this that uh, if you you know you experience less time uh or more time based upon the gravitational pull so gravity has a very specific effect on our experience of time so um so the scientific key scientific ideas about reality have changed but reality itself does not change so scientific knowledge is not absolute knowledge it's not um uh you know it may lead us to reality but it's but science itself changes so therefore uh, it's not the only pathway to knowledge so uh, these are various you know very nice um, arguments that all of you have given yet there's a even more fundamental problem with these claims and that is that these two claims are mutually contradictory uh, why are they contradictory they say for the uh, scientific materialists they say that only claims derived from science can be true that is their epistemological claim right that science is the only pathway to knowledge but that claim is not derived from science but is a, an assumption or a belief very key point but that claim the claim that science is the only pathway to knowledge is an assumption it's a belief that's not a scientific claim it's not a scientific conclusion in of itself therefore that claim violates materialism's own criteria do you understand so that claim that science is the only pathway to knowledge is not a scientific claim science itself never says that it's the only pathway to knowledge it is certainly a pathway to knowledge it certainly gives us knowledge about the nature of the world and about you know how the world functions how microwaves work or how you know vehicles cars work even how you know uh, the the universe is is working the mechanics of some aspects of the universe but it never claims that it's the only pathway to knowledge the view that science is the only pathway to knowledge is an assumption or a belief like praveen uh, was saying a uh, very nice point that you were making that uh, it could be true it's possible that science is the only pathway to knowledge but that claim is an assumption it's not a scientific conclusion it's it's uh, not a scientific uh, you know uh, the result of a scientific idea therefore uh, it is really a form of faith it's a, it's their form of you know it's it's their own perspective it's it's not 
uh, something that in of itself is based on science. And you might be wondering, well, you know, who believes this? But, you know, just a few years ago, I was in India and I was doing a tour of different universities and colleges there, uh, speaking at different science programs. And so many of the students there were, ex were in India, in the, you could say in the land of spirituality, uh, they were repeating this very point that, uh, oh, you know, I believe in science. And because I believe in science, there's not any knowledge anywhere else. There's no other pathway to knowledge. Uh, this, this, you know, the sages or the spiritual books or the scriptures, these things have no knowledge to offer. That is more a, an ism, scientific materialism. It's turning science into a religion. Science, the very fact that makes it so, so powerful and so useful is that science itself is not a religion. It is a methodology. It's a certain process of gaining knowledge, but it never claims monopoly over knowledge. Now, as I mentioned, this doesn't necessarily mean that materialism's ontological claim is false. Like I said, it's possible. It's, it's, you know, it might be the case that all of reality is only chemicals and anything, the only thing that is real is something that we can see and measure. But this is an assumption, not a scientific conclusion, and needs to be recognized as such. So, for example, I men mentioned Richard Dawkins, right, as one of the scientific materialists. And it's very interesting. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to study at Oxford. That's where I did my PhD. And many of the philosophers and theologians there, uh, one theologian in particular who I studied under, he wrote a book on contemporary um, theologians, theologians meaning, you know, uh, or like a form of philosophy, but it's focused on God, theology. So um, he, uh, he made a list of all the contemporary theologians, and he put Richard Dawkins in that list. Why? Because of this recognition that it's an assumption. It's not a scientific conclusion. And uh, science itself never makes claims about God. Science doesn't prove the existence of God. So that, uh, that viewpoint is also flawed to say that science proves the existence of God. Science does not prove the existence of God, nor does it disprove the existence of God. Science is primarily concerned with just studying the nature of the natural world. If God, by definition, is beyond space and time, and science is dedicated to studying space and time, then by nature, by the very nature of, this, of the, the methodology, the, the, the topic of God is beyond, or you could say, not, uh, not the topic, but uh, the, the, the proof of God is beyond scientific reach. However, science can lead us in certain directions and scientific ideas can point uh, towards the existence of God, as, as we will see in my next talk when I talk about the Big Bang cosmology and how Big Bang cosmology, which is a very commonly accepted scientific theory today, how it is compatible with and it points towards the existence of something that is beyond space and time, a divine intelligence that's the source of this world. Um, so uh, science is more a methodology, and to turn the methodology into a conclusion, uh, specifically a religious conclusion, is a mistake. So here is a uh, uh, you know a comic that that uh, illustrates this point: that science, one reason it is a very powerful methodology and it's very good at what it does, is that it doesn't assume miracles. In the scientific process, uh, maybe some of your students. If you're asked to, uh, um, to solve a mathematical equation, and in, as one of the steps of those equations, you say a miracle occurs, then obviously you will not get the full marks on that problem. Why? Because science doesn't assume miracles. It doesn't consider miracles as one of the steps in its uh, problem solving process. However, Science also does not deny the possibility of miracles. Miracles could exist. And in fact, uh, we were just mentioning Einstein. 
uh, as we will see, um, Einstein was convinced that the world is miraculous. Um, so there's a, a quote from Einstein that says that this world is a miracle and we should not rid the world of the miraculous. Um, and it's a fact, if we carefully examine the world, we see just how miraculous it is. And there's certain things that are, um, that are uh, uh, you know, uh, so miraculous that one cannot, one cannot wrap one's head around it. Uh, like, for example, many dimensions in mathematics, we talk about the sixth or seventh dimension. It's something that we, you know, we write in mathematical formulas, but we actually cannot conceive of it. How can there be something uh, beyond three dimensions? So um, science's methodology is one that does not assume miracles, but at the same time, it does not deny the possibility of miracles. Now, um, this naturally raises the question of what is science? You know, uh, is science uh, something that is strictly based upon things that are verifiable, things that are, you know, measurable and quantifiable. So, um, so on one hand, we said that, well, science is good at what it does, and this is his methodology. It depends on things that are measurable and quantifiable. Um, uh, but is even that statement true? Is, is science simply about things that are measurable and quantifiable? Well, uh, you could say in, in the history of the, the, the rise of science, there's a form of philosophy called logical positivism. It's again, a very, very common uh, form of philosophy, very well known. And in the 19th and 20th century, this, um, th these ideas became very prominent. And um, in Vienna, there's a Okay, so now uh, let me see if uh, any question has come up. So, okay, I would request till some questions are not, I think people are typing. So, okay, so one question has come from, uh, Okay, so which stream or course to take to deeply study such topics? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, this is discussed quite a bit in the philosophy of science. So what is science? Um, how do we define scientific study? What is the role of science, the place of science in the, you could say, in the, uh, in, in, the in the world of knowledge, so to say? So philosophy of science is a good area to look into. Um, another area is um, um, just books on science and religion. So there's many uh, good books that are available on science and religion, and um, you can you can read books on on science and religion, uh, such as by John Hadley Brook, uh, Philip Clayton. Arthur Peacock, these were all very famous writers in science and religion. John Balkinghorn. Right. So there's a comment from uh, Somya Gupta. On spiritual path also, there is importance of experience. I mm -hmm. seem to agree with logical positivism. The process of Krishna consciousness does not become very real until we have experience. Mm. Yes. So um, actually, it's very interesting uh, that many of the uh, spiritual leaders, they also have mentioned that uh, knowledge that um, you could say ultimate knowledge is experienced through experience. So uh, ultimate knowledge is, is uh, gained through experience um, when we actually experience God through our senses, uh, we, have, we have actual knowledge. Um, so, yes, it is true that ultimately uh, we will experience things that we uh, hold dear to us. However, um, that experience may not be public, right? So our, even if we do experience God, that experience may not be the same 
as the experience of, for example, heating your food in the microwave. I can put my food in the microwave, it's, it's hot. Someone else puts their food in the microwave, it also comes out hot. So um, the reason why science is, you could say, so popular is because the scientific results are public to everyone. They, they are, those experiences can be tried and tested by everyone and they'll get the same, same experience. Uh, but in terms of spiritual experience, religious experience of experiencing God, that can be available to everyone. The same process can be taken, but, um, but it is still a personal experience. In other words, um, you know, you, you uh, 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 may experience it individually. And so, um, and, and that is true of many, many different experiences in this world that we have. For example, the experience of love. If I love someone, I love them, but not everyone else may love them or not everyone else may have that same experience of loving them. But that does not mean that that experience is a false experience just because it is private, just because it is individual. So, um, so yes, logical positivism is making a good point, but, but it's not... Um, it's not a, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the basic claim that something has to be true uh, only if it is experienceable at the present moment is not a true statement. Okay, so uh, there is another uh, comment from uh, Shankar Das. He says that science had shown us the path through various discoveries in the last 1,000 years, hmm. but not reached that state where spiritual where the spiritual state exists. The reason I understand that uh, this world or universe is running on mathematical model or probabilities, humans has discovered very few mathematical probabilities to work upon. We need more computational power to understand universal model through science. Maybe in next 20 years, we can answer this through quantum computing. What is your point of view on above? Well, uh, this is something that, uh, that John Searle actually has a very good ar article that he talks about, where he says that, uh, that, you know, the simulation of something, the simulation of something is not, isn't that thing, isn't uh, the thing that it simulates. Just like to give you an example, an example that he gives is a very famous uh, philosopher of mind, uh, author in that. He says that the simulation of milk, just say if you make a perfectly simulated model of milk, the simulation of milk is not the same as milk or the experience of milk, right? So if you, if you um, uh, make a simulation of milk and you give it to a small child, a, a one-year-old, that will not nourish them. Why? Because substance also matters. You may simulate the milk, but that milk is not the same as the milk unless it is also the same substance. In the same way, we may simulate the universe. I mean, just to simulate the brain is virtually impossible. There's, you know, about, you know, one, one trillion neurons firing in the brain, uh, it's like a brain is in of itself an entire universe. And in this universe, there are billions of brains and we cannot even simulate one brain. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's actually um, rather uh, fantastic or you could say imaginative to say that in 20 years, we'll be able to simulate the universe because even to simulate the brain, will take hundreds of years or, or millions of years. Uh, there is a question that was asked by uh, many top evolutionary biologists, many of whom did, were atheists or did not believe in God. And they asked the question that through, uh, can um, science be sure that, that all the aspects, all human faculties 
were produced through human evolution. So through the evolutionary process, all the human faculties came about. And guess what the most common response was the, of the leading scientists? It was, we will never know. Why? Because they said that there's so many human faculties that just to study the fact and to demonstrate whether or not those human faculties could have been developed through an evolutionary process will take millions of scientists, millions of years to cover all those things because the human person is so complex. And a human being is just one little element of this universe. So just keep that in mind also that, that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, that in 20 years, we can actually simulate the universe. I don't think so. However, even if we could, even if we could simulate the universe, John Searle is saying that the simulation of the universe is not the same as a universe, obviously, right? Well, therefore, this, through the simulation, we also cannot experience the universe, that is, understand the universe, because it's, it's a different substance. A simulation is a different substance than the actual thing, like milk is different than simulated milk. In the same way, simulated consciousness, artificial consciousness, is different than consciousness, he's saying, because of the substance. Just because you can simulate a human being doesn't mean you'll have a human being because the substance matters. The substance counts. So, um, so I, I would say that uh, as a response, it's a very good question, very excellent question. And there's some very good responses to this as well. Okay, so another uh, uh, question from Atul Singh. He's saying, dear sir, as you said, science is just a small perspective to understand reality. My question is, as a science student, what should be our attitude while studying science? Mm. So uh, um, this is precisely the point, actually, that we science is very valuable, but we should have the right attitude when we uh, uh, when we are studying science. Not just we, but 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 scientists in general, and uh, many great authors um, uh, have talked about this, and they've talked about humility in the sciences where although we study science and we, you know, we applaud the discoveries of science, we should also be humble. Scientists and science should also be humble in realizing the limitations of science. As everyone should be humble, science should also be humble in understanding the limitations of science. Just as I was mentioning right now that, you know, scientists today say there are a hundred billion galaxies, each containing a hundred billion stars. Now, as far as we know, no one actually counted those 100 billion galaxies. There could have been 101 billion galaxies, each containing 89 billion stars. I mean, it's an approximation. Someone comes up with a very good approximation, they put it out there. But this universe is so literally unlimited, 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars. Um, uh, you know, what is, the, what is the, you know, the purview of our knowledge? We're just scratching the surface. And, and, um, and so we, we should recognize when we study science, the limitations, uh, the limited amount of knowledge that we have. And secondly, we should also recognize the limitations of the scientific method that based upon experience and reason, we can only come so far. There are things or aspects about the universe that may be beyond our experience, but that are also true. So, um, so uh, uh, science is studying a certain aspect of the world and it's studying it very well. We should respect it for that, but also understand the limitations of its knowledge and the limitations of its methodology. Okay, so, so Ankur Dvivedi is asking, what are the other pathways of knowledge apart from science? Mm, very nice, okay. Yeah. Well, um, scientists today are, even some scientists, they're looking into yoga and spirituality because this pathway of knowledge is rather than the ascending method is through the descending method. Oh, this is called revealed knowledge. Uh, through meditation, through spiritual practice, the knowledge um, is revealed to, to the practitioner. And um, this knowledge is like the knowledge 
that we gain, for example, uh, by, by hearing the wisdom of, of someone who has knowledge. We may not go in a laboratory, we may not experiment with it, we may not um, uh, be able to uh, put it in a test tube, but it is knowledge that is given through, um, through a uh, intelligence that may be higher than ours, right? through a higher intelligence. So the other pathways of knowledge are, um, they also involve experience. They also involve reason. They're, they're very important parts of it. Religion is also based upon reason and experience. In fact, experience is one of the most fundamental aspects of religion, but um, they're not limited to experience and reason. They are also um, relying upon revelation or knowledge that is revealed. Right. So, so coming to the next question by Asit Nema, is experience the ultimate? Does experience also have limitations? Experienced linked to ability to interpret the experience. Mm. <laughs> wow, very nice question. So here we, we have been talking about spiritual experience. Uh, so, you know, someone mentioned that how uh, in spirituality, we also have experience and especially in the final experience, uh, maybe after death or uh, when we become self-realized. But that experience, at the present moment, we don't have experience of. Or in terms of our conversation, we really cannot get into. But yes, that is the, the, the core issue, that experience, um, experience definitely has its limitations uh, because our senses are so limited. So therefore, I mean... Um, uh, even if we gain a knowledge through experience, how much of that reality are we experiencing? And uh, in the scientific context, in the worldly context, uh, we see that people experience things very differently. And I was actually thinking about talking about this, but then I, due to the limitation of time, I didn't. There's a very interesting thesis called the Duham Quine thesis. And Duham Quine, they actually argue very successfully that how you really cannot prove anything in this world. There's no, uh, that experimental knowledge, experimental knowledge cannot prove anything in this, ultimately cannot actually prove anything in this world. Why? Because our knowledge through experience is also based upon our, our social perspectives, our own perspective. And so what I experience is going to be fundamentally and inherently I different. So, uh, so my experience will be different than your experience and someone else's experience will be different than my experience. This is a commonly known uh, phenomenon, right? Um, uh, so experience is also socially affected. Um, uh, uh, they say that how, um, how any theory can have uh, multiple hypotheses that make that theory true and how uh, any theory can have multiple hypotheses that make it true. And uh, the second part is um, that uh, many, uh, uh, many hypotheses can uh, prove the same theory. And so, or many experiences could prove the same theory or, or the same theory can, you know, be true through many different hypotheses and these hypotheses can be contradictory. So therefore, our, this, is, this is fundamentally the problem with experience, that our experience uh, is, um, uh, cannot give us the final conclusion because it is inherently subjective, it is inherently relative. Now, spiritual experience may be different, but until we experience it, we really cannot, uh, you know, say something uh, conclusive. The spiritual experience is direct experience. It is of the heart and it is directly, you know, you know experiencing a higher reality. Um, but experience in general is subjective. And so therefore, it's, it's, it, is, it can indicate the truth, 
but again, it is not, you know, it's not the, um, the final word on truth. Okay, so uh, uh, one question. So how, uh, just a minute, sorry. Uh, how to, how the scientists give theory about evolution when they cannot perceive it now or neither can prove it? Hmm. So I think he meant to say that whether this is a scientific theory or not at all. Hmm. Well, uh, scientists uh, say that there are indications, uh, you, you could say, especially in terms of genetics and things like that. Uh, that's sort of the, now the biggest arguments for evolution, that there are indications that suggest that evolution took place based upon the fossil record and, um, uh, you know, studies of genes and how genes mutate. So due to these reasons, um, uh, evolution is possible. Now, from you know, my own perspective is that evolution may have been possible. It may have been that evolution did happen. But the, the thing that science does not um, deny is the fact that that evolution was guided. By itself, what I think is impossible is that that evolutionary process just happened by itself. You know, uh, you know, I, I recently purchased a home. You know, uh, so so we have a home, and the uh, and uh, the home has you know so many. You could say it has it has wood and paint and um, just basic things, basic things, nothing very complex. <coughs> just uh, <coughs> glass and wood and paint, basic things. And I was just thinking one day. I was thinking, well, you know, I. Uh, you work so hard, people work so hard to get a home, right? Now, just imagine that you take this wood and paint and you put it together in a big pile and you just blow it up. All of a sudden, there's an explosion of wood and paint. I mean, would you expect that that wood and paint would just turn into a house? I mean, it could, maybe, maybe it might turn into a house, but you wouldn't expect such a thing to happen, that if you, that if you have wood and paint sitting somewhere and you, you light it and you blow it up, all of a sudden it turns into a house. You wouldn't expect that to, to happen, right? Well, this universe and human beings are so complex. They're so intricate. I mean, just to mimic human voice is you know, a huge um, scientific challenge. Now, science has advanced so much, but still, in a few minutes, you can figure out, oh, is this a computer or is this a human being that's speaking? Human beings are so sensitive. They're so, um, you know, so also diverse and different and unique in their own ways. Human beings have so many faculties. And all of that came about by an explosion that was not guided, that had no intelligence behind it. Even our Bhagavatam, it speaks about you know, a whole process of creation. But there's a guidance behind it. There's a guidance of how these different species, you know, manifest. So, so I mean, our, our uh, perspective is not so much, uh, you know, it's not, the main problem is not exactly just the evolutionary theory, but the Problem, main problem is that how could it just be random and unguided? There has to be some guidance. And if there is a guidance, well, maybe evolution happened, maybe it didn't. That's not so important for us. What's important is that it was guided. There's an intelligence behind it. It could be that God created the world that way. It could be that God created each world, each species separately. Either way, okay. But is there an intelligence behind it? That's the real question. And as far as I have seen, for me, the data points towards the fact that there is an intelligence behind this process. Based on what we experience in this world, based on, on what uh, our own experience tells us, things uh, de-evolute or things get destroyed over time, 
they generally don't get cultivated and in such complex and beautiful ways as human beings are over time by themselves. There's always an intelligence or a guidance behind things. I mean, why would people work so hard and why would houses be so expensive if through an explosion you could build a house? You know, there, there, should, be some, uh, there should be some guidance behind any form of creation. Wonderful. So uh, another question is why, why intelligent design movement received so much of criticism in US? Mm, yes. So one of the reasons it received um, criticism is because not because of the idea itself, but because it was claiming to be science. And that's where this topic about the scientific methodology is so important that that uh, there's some mistake on this side as well in terms of intelligent design that uh, i mean intelligent uh, uh, it, it's it's like i was saying it's wrong to say that science prove uh, disproves the existence of god which is what scientific materialism is doing it's saying that science disproves the existence of god it's it's not true but it's also incorrect to say that science proves the the existence of god why because as I was saying, science defines itself. It says that it deals with the world of space and time. I mean, at least right now, maybe science will change. But then to say, well, um, the idea of an intelligent designer uh, is an idea within space and time, and it's something that is, you know, um, a scientific conclusion is also not, a, philosophically speaking, it's not a fair statement. Science can point to God. Science is compatible with the idea of God, but science, uh, the, the strictly experimental method uh, of experiment or the methodology that science is using, it is about manipulating matter. So those people in the intelligent design movement who said that God is the, is the factual result of the scientific process or scientific discoveries, they were making a claim that could be true, but it wasn't exactly um, you know, a, a claim that was found within the scientific process. Um, so, so it's not, the criticism is not against intelligent design per se. It is against the claim that uh, science proves the existence of God or science proves the existence of an intelligent designer. And even our acharyas, even the great acharyas like Ramanuj Acharya, have said that through the strictly logical method, through the method of um, uh, um, uh, natural theology or or uh, scientific creationism, one cannot prove the existence of a personal god. You cannot prove that. You can infer it, but you cannot prove it. Knowledge about God is received, as I mentioned through the descending method. There is an aspect of, of you could say, um, revelation that needs to take place to get conclusive knowledge. Reason leads us in that direction. Uh, ultimate spiritual experience does happen. But initially, uh, just when we are starting on our journey, we do need to um, rely upon um, revelation for guidance as to the nature of God. And this is not something very, you could say, unique or something bad. Uh, even in the scientific world, in order to learn science, you first of all have to take the time to learn it. I mean, you have to um, uh, hear from the giants, as they say. You have to learn from the giants. What, what, what are you know, Einstein and Newton and all these people saying? And uh, then you get some knowledge and then you can go in the laboratory and actually start seeing things, experiencing things. In the same way, in terms of spiritual knowledge, you also need to get some guidance from the giants, from the people who have seen God, who have experienced God, and uh, start on that spiritual path. And that, that spiritual path may lead to some experience, but it does have an aspect of revelation. So the intelligent design movement uh, was trying to argue, and they were not the only ones. In the history, there has been so many... Um, movements like this. They are trying to argue for the existence of God. Some of them were simply on the basis of reason and experience. And that was, that was not uh, completely logically coherent. 
um, even even religious practitioners say that revelation is important. So um, I have a question in this. Uh, so uh, when we say revelation is the way for religion is to claim us. Anyway, it, it, it has to be all three reason, experience and revelation. And revelation. In other words, yeah, revelation meaning uh, learning from the saints, people who have had the experience and reason, learning from the scriptures. So it, all three of them have to work together to get knowledge about God. Okay, so another question is coming from Ipsita. The concept of time and creation, as explained in Srimad Bhagavatam, does it have parallel in modern scientific theories? Are they similar or different? Ah, so that's a very big question. Certainly, there are. There, there are a, a lot of parallels. One parallel, I'll just focus on one, is about how time is relative. It's very interesting that Bhagavatam is speaking about uh, time being relative, many, many, you know, thousands of years before Einstein discovered the relativity of time. So certainly um, the Bhagavatam talks about how space and time, uh, particularly time, it talks about time is relative. And modern science has also uh, suggested that time is relative. Also in terms of the time periods, uh, the Bhagavatam talks about how, uh, you know, it talks about the creation and the um, history of the universe in terms of billions of years. And science also talks about it in terms of billions of years. So there are many things that resonate between the Vedas and science. Yeah. Okay, so one last question. So we have uh, talked about experience a lot in, in our discussion in the last half an hour. So can you suggest some spiritual practice to the audience so that can enhance their experience of spiritual life or spiritual practices? Mm, very interesting. Huh. That's a, a very nice question. Um, so uh, a, a, scientific, um, a scientific area that has not been developed enough, scientists themselves are making this point an area of science that has not been developed that much is the science of sound. Right? Sound, scientists are starting to realize its power, but sound is a very, very powerful, very powerful uh, energy in this world. And it has not been studied deeply enough. And just to give you an example of the power of, of sound, look at our cell phones, right? In India, you know, people may not have you know, they may not have a house, but they will have a cell phone. Uh, they may, you know, everyone has a cell phone. And, uh, you know, almost 2 billion people are connected with one another. Everyone is connected by this little phone. And you can be sitting in Madhuvan and be talking to someone in New York. It's mystical. It's actually mystical. Like, you know, I, I, if you wrap your head around it and, and then millions of people, it's not then just that you are talking, millions of other people are also talking all at the same time, all privately. Look at the power of sound. I mean, and these are not, and you can't hear that sound. These are sound waves that are traveling throughout the universe. And that wave is present anywhere in this world such that you can be talking to someone in New York, but if that person in New York all, all of a sudden goes to Sweden, you're talking to that person in Sweden, you're talking to that person in France. How powerful is this energy of sound? So, so the, all the world's religions, the religions of the world are telling us that in fact, it is very powerful, that sound is a very powerful energy and we should tap into that power by, uh, by experiencing or experimenting with spiritual sound, spiritual sound. Right? So therefore, um, you know, spiritual practice begins with mantra meditation, by the chanting of mantras. Uh, and this is true in all the world's religions. Jesus said, hallowed be thy name. He talked about talking about, uh, you know, repeating God's names um, in, in Islam. This is also the case. And in our Vedic scriptures, this is also the case, that the power of mantras is so strong that through sound, we can, we can identify, we can touch, and we can relate 
with a higher reality. Through sound, we can tap into a higher um, reality. We can experience and connect with a spiritual reality. So the spiritual practice that I would suggest is mantra meditation. There's many people on this call who can teach you that mantra meditation, how to, um, uh, through spiritual sound, which is the name of God, how we can connect with, with, uh, with the divine, with God. Okay, so wonderful. So uh, questions are still pouring in, but I think uh, uh, we'll stop now. And uh, if Sita, I think you have again dropped a question, so we'll take your question next time. And uh, finally, uh, we thank uh, Professor Gopal Gupta for uh, uh, giving us such a wonderful seminar and then uh, discussion afterwards. And uh, special thank to him because at his time, uh, uh, when he, we started, it was 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. in the morning. So he has taken a lot of pain for us. So we again thank him for the wonderful seminar and discussions. Thank you, uh, Professor Gupta. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, very pleasurable to talk to all of you. And I hope that you, uh, I hope that you continue to progress on your journey on science and spirituality. And you're part of a very good group. So keep, uh, keep discussing and keep conversing on these very important issues. This is the, uh, the main, uh, you can say the main need in society today are these types of conversations and these types of uh, discussions. So thank you very much. Right. Thank you.